I am so excited. We have over 139 people and people just keep flooding in. So we definitely got the word out about this. I hope that this information is really gonna make a difference for you as you begin to plan for your own retirement. Um, and as all of us as parents who have children who have a need for lifetime support, unfortunately, we're always planning for our own demise as well, right? So we need to know what's going to be there for our sons and daughters when we are either gone um, disabled or retire. And our amazing guest, Daniel Fortunio, who is here, he's in Southern California. Um, if you're here from out of California, we're in Northern California in the Bay Area. Silicon Valley is kind of our home. And so we are not going to do too much blabbing. We're going to get right to the really important information that you're here for. And I want to introduce the amazing Daniel Fortunio, who has helped friends of mine, my own family members, to secure benefits. So he's a benefits expert, largely in California and a few other states. He'll touch on that. And he's just simply amazing, full of knowledge, and really is going to have you walk away being able to make some plans. So without further listening to me, I'm going to turn this over to Daniel. And Daniel, thank you so much for being here today and being willing to share your time. I know how busy you are supporting individuals and their families. And I just can't thank you enough. You're always available um, when we invite you to come and join PHP and, and inform others. So. Take it away, Daniel. Well, thank you, Judy. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to do this work for almost 30 years. So what's going on is somebody's translation is... Uh, Claudia, can you check on that? Spanish is coming through. Yes. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, as I tell people, and this is a uh, expression I learned here uh, in California, benefits are very much like a dysfunctional family. They don't make any common sense. Never have, never will. They're based on laws that are written by lawmakers that mean well, but they actually oftentimes don't even understand what the genuine needs of an individual with a disability are. So what I have found uh, from my years back when I first started this work uh, with people who live with HIV and AIDS and were dying before they were getting on benefits is I needed to make friends in Social Security and learn how this all works so that I could get people on the program. And as a result, some almost 40 years, uh, I'm still doing this work now with what the uh, term of art that they use these days is the cross disability community. Um, there's all these terms that you hear these days. Uh, so if I don't hit one right in your geographic area, please do forgive me. Uh, our focus today is gonna be California. Uh, many of these rules uh, have national implications. Uh, I am gonna specifically be touching on California's uh, Medicaid program, which we call Medi-Cal. But a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, is applicable uh, in uh, the rest of the states. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and begin, if my system will allow me. There we go. So we're going to be covering today public coverage. So when it comes to the issue of income, we'll be talking about SSI and SSDI. When it comes to the issue of health coverage, we're gonna be talking about Medi-Cal, which in other states uh, is called Medicaid. Um, some states, the way California has renamed it, like Massachusetts, uh, call it MassHealth. Uh, I have knowledge of 14 states uh, that I have available to me. It's not that difficult uh, working in another state. I just have to do the research uh, on how their Medicaid system is structured. Okay, come on. 
Okay, so uh, let's get into the uh, Social Security programs, SSI and SSDI. And as you can see, the acronyms are very similar to each other, so people confuse them. I refer to these as twins. They look alike, they sound alike, but they're completely separate programs in the same family of Social Security. So SSI stands for Supplemental Security Income. And it's really important that you begin, as you begin to go into this world, uh, or if you're already in this world with uh, your child, that you use the correct acronym. It's not uncommon that people will call Social Security and ask a question about SSI because they think that that term means Social Security Income. And as you see here, it stands for Supplemental Security Income. They'll ask the question, they'll get the right answer, but their child was actually on SSDI. So it's really important that uh, you understand the difference and you take notes in the sense of, of having the clarity of what the difference is of what benefit your, your child uh, or your family member are on. Supplemental security income uh, comes with Medi-Cal, which is Medicaid in other states. Uh, many states do it automatically, not all. Some states require an additional application uh, for the Medicaid. Uh, Social Security Disability is SSDI, and that comes with Medicare. That is the same nationally. Now, the first program that I want to get into is Childhood Disabled Beneficiary, known as CDB. And you're going to notice there are acronyms everywhere when we deal with this. And some of the acronyms actually match the words in the, in the, that are being described, and some do not. So uh, just be aware of that. Now, the Childhood Disabled Beneficiary, uh, they changed that name about 15 years ago, but many people still refer to this same exact program as Disabled Adult Child Benefits. So you may hear them interchangeably. So it's, you know, and I'm going to use them interchangeably so that you get accustomed to the acronym or the name of this particular program. So it's known as Childhood Disabled Beneficiary or Disabled Adult Child. Now, my goal here today is to give you a baseline of information. I'm gonna stop and, and take questions. And then at the end, I'm just gonna open it up for whatever questions you have. If you have questions that's not covering the subject matter, I'm not gonna be able to do, address everything. I'll do the best that I can. And occasionally somebody will come up with something that's not a part of the 97%, well, let's be honest, 87% of this stuff I have memorized. And I would have to, at some point, figure out how to get back to you all. OK, so we have a childhood disabled beneficiary. They can become eligible for Social Security disability insurance based on a parent's record. Now, Social Security disability onset, and whenever we say Social Security disability onset, we mean that period of time that Social Security has acknowledged the start of the disability. And acknowledging the start of the disability is very important. You have no idea how many times I have families that say, my child's been disabled since birth, since birth and we had all the evaluations at age 13, and now they're 18 and nothing's changed. And I'm like, well, nothing's changed, but your evidence to get them on the program is now aged because it's greater than a year. And so it's not current. And that's a big problem. So if we're talking about somebody's onset, we're talking about when the medical record is able to support that that individual is disabled. I had a young woman who tested at age 16 uh, being legally blind. She turned 18 and we had to retest her because there wasn't anything in the system that was current. Again, this is part of what doesn't make common sense. Now, so the individual, number one, has to have a onset of disability, and this is for individuals to get a benefit based on a parent's record uh, between the ages of 18 and prior to 22. An eligible parent is a parent who has retired, become disabled, or who has passed away. So it's retired, disabled, 
according to Social Security, or has passed away. Now, if we have a disabled or a retired parent, the child receives an amount that's half of what the parent's benefit is. So as a simple, straightforward example, if mom is eligible for $2,000 a month based on social security, either disability or retirement, then her child who has a disability between 18 and 22, and the medical evidence is in that spot that shows that they're disabled, then they will get an amount that's equal to 50%. So they would be eligible for $1,000 a month. It doesn't come out of the parent's benefit. It is a benefit that comes to the child directly from Social Security based on the contribution of the parent. Now, upon the death of the parent, the child would receive a benefit that's equal to three quarters of what the parent's benefit is. And this is the real place that uh, makes a huge difference to get these kind of benefits for uh, individuals who are living with disabilities. Now, it's a very important note because I understand that, you know, in the disability community, there's a lot of forward movement. And the fact that we want children to, or individuals with disability to work. And, you know, the young children, the young adults, you know, they start doing work activity. They'll work at, you know, a grocery store and they'll do all these different things to try to figure out where they actually are able to create a life for themselves in the world of work. Well, if the individual has substantial gainful activity, uh, before they're eligible for the, uh, the SSDI benefit under childhood disabled benefits, then they could lose future eligibility. It is possible that they will lose the eligibility for benefits based on the parent's record. And as you can see in this example, substantial gainful activity is uh, for 2021 is $1,310. That is the amount nationally, except for the state of Hawaii and Alaska, that is used for substantial gainful activity. They have their own substantial gainful activity. Uh, and I don't remember what it is. I don't have that memorized, but I have it written somewhere. Uh, so when it comes to this issue, this is a real problem. Uh, but there is a way, whenever there's a problem, many times, to get around it. My biggest problem that I have that's difficult to get around is when I have an individual that does not have good medical documentation to support disability. The issue of work activity potentially can be dealt with in that if that individual is getting some kind of support, some kind of additional support to be able to do that work like a job coach, extra hours to do the job, they have different standards that they're under to be able to do the work activity. We can reduce the value of those wages and we're doing it so that that individual doesn't lose the future eligibility for benefits based on mom or dad's contributions. The term is called subsidy uh, for special or a special, or excuse me, I'm losing English here, subsidy special conditions. So it's commonly referred to as work subsidy. How it works is as follows. Uh, the individual may be able to reduce the value of the wages. Doesn't impact the money they're making, but we're gonna reduce the value of the wages when Social Security looks at the value of the wages. And so as an example, you can have somebody who's reducing the value of their wages. You, you need uh, to assign me. Subsidy. You, you need to assign me. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was getting somebody who came. I am not assigned yeah. myself. Claudia, can you please put Beatrice in the um, translation room? Okay. So, when you have an individual uh, who has um, work subsidy, what we're doing is we're reducing the value of the earnings below substantial gainful activity for. Uh, an issue such as 
their being able to be qualified for disabled adult child or childhood disabled eligibility, or just reducing the value of the wages for other issues such as if somebody's doing work activity uh, and they're dealing with uh, the issue, and I'll briefly touch on this later, of trial work months or extended period of eligibility. Now, to be able to get this, the employer is allowed to, to the term of art is subsidized earnings. When employers hear this, they think it's, oh my God, I don't, I don't wanna pay any extra. Well, no, all it is is that they document the kind of accommodations that they provide. And this is an example of where social security use terminology and they do it all over the place, where they use terminology that doesn't make any common sense to an individual, it does to them, and then everybody's confused. So all we're doing here is we're saying, employer, you're accommodating Johnny, so let's go ahead and formalize this on paper so the value of his wages aren't considered fully. They refer to the three types of subsidies that are offered as employer subsidy, non-specific subsidy, and special conditions. These are all part of the forms that are gonna be completed. They're pretty straightforward. You ask an employer to fill out an SSA 3033, and that addresses the performance of the individual, the productivity of the individual, and an unsuccessful work attempt. These are the issues that Social Security looks on based on what the employer tells them. And I have employers do it all the time, Sometimes the employers are like, well, I don't want to fill out this form. What's my legal liability? All they're doing is formalizing something they're doing for the, to accommodate Johnny, as an example, uh, to be able to do the work activity. And then the value of his wages are considered to be less than what they actually are. So Social Security reviews the form and determines and reduces the value of the wages anywhere from 50% down to zero. I've had a form, I've had an employer who accommodated the individual and did all kinds of special things and they filled out the form that nothing was done. You know, Susie was just like everybody else. She's treated like everybody else. She's not, and then it was like, well, it didn't do us any good. Now, the, uh, I'm gonna give you just a quick example and then I'm gonna go into questions about the issues that I've talked about so far. If I get a question that's gonna be discussed in the future, I will let you know that and then we'll cover it then if the moderators can assist me with helping me to, to recapture that question. So Rita works at Walmart and she earns $1,500 per month. She has a job coach with her daily. You don't have to have a job coach. This is an example of an accommodation. Social Security determines that she is going to get a 50% work subsidy based on how the form was completed. And what occurs is even though she's making $1,500 a month, which we know for this year is greater than SGA, Social Security only considers $750 of her monthly earnings. So that's what they're looking at when it comes to different areas and the different programs. This is extremely beneficial. It's often missed and not used. Now I'll go ahead and begin taking questions and I'm gonna take notes as I take questions because I'm a visual person and it will help me to be clear on not making sure I've got it correctly. So Thank if you would please, I'm ready. All right, I am here with the questions. So the 1310 per month question came up a couple of times. Could you redefine that? Okay, so we're talking about substantial gainful activity and substantial gainful activity is uh, whenever social security has a dollar amount that has an impact in different areas of their program, they give it a special name. And this particular name is substantial gainful activity. And that impacts an individual when social security amount, the dollar amount this year is 1310. 
that amount in in uh, impacts an individual in many places. I'll give you some example. Place number one: if you're doing a Social Security application and you're genuinely disabled, then you have a medical record that supports your disability, but you're able to earn greater than one thousand three hundred and ten dollars a month in gross wages, you're not disabled. You don't meet their criteria. Social Security provides a benefit or their definition of disability is that you're unable to work for at least a year or more. Working is earning substantial gainful activity. That's one place it's used, the definition. Another place it's used uh, is when we're looking at an individual that is um, applying for benefits based on the parent's record, but they had all this work in the past. If the work that they had in the past, whatever substantial gainful activity is for that particular calendar year, and that's gross income before taxes, and they did it consistently, and they have no work subsidy like I just described, then they're not going to be able to get a benefit based on their parent. So as an example, substantial gainful activity for last year was $1,260. Uh, for 2019 was $1,220. What you have to be careful of is when you hear these numbers, our minds go, oh, it's a number I'm going to memorize and I'm going to keep Susie from never, ever, ever making more than that amount of money. Well, I like to think of these programs as a safety net. If I have an individual that even though ha they have a pretty significant disability, they're able to find work activity that generates a significant amount of income from themselves. That's good enough because they can always fall back on that. They may not need mom's benefit or dad's benefit when they retire. They may have sufficient income. We don't want to create a welfare box so that our children, you know, or the person with the disability is, I'm going to be poor because I'm on disability. Well, you know, if they could work, that's great. The program's still there to fall back on. Next question. Okay, there are several. So I'm gonna um, see if we can't tick through these. Um, and I think this is true for a lot of people on this meeting may wonder if the parent is on SSDI of any sort or even social security payments, um, does the child forfeit his SSI to receive SSDI? Okay, so let's understand what SSI is. SSI stands for Supplemental Security Income, payer of last resort. So they're to supplement based on that state's amount. So if I'm eligible for a benefit based on mom or dad, of $1,000, well, pretty much throughout the country, that's greater than SSI. So where's my loss? I'm in a better place financially. Now, if you're concerned about the health coverage continuation, I'll be discussing that shortly because the health coverage doesn't go away. The Medicaid or Medi-Cal doesn't go away. And another benefit is that after 24 months of being on the benefit based on the parent, they become eligible for Medicare, allowing them to potentially being eligible for Medicare and Medicaid in California, we call it Medi-Cal. Okay. So it's not that there's a forfeit, it's that the benefit is reduced, but they're still at a higher place financially as that benefit is reduced. Right, the SSI is reduced, right? Correct. And it may be reduced to as little as zero. Yeah, but that means that you're getting greater significant yeah. benefit than your state amount. Excellent, thank you. So there are a lot of questions around when should I retire? When should I do that so that my child can get um, part of my contributions, which often is more money, right? Most of the time it's more money depending on who worked. Uh, so is there an advantage to waiting where the parent gets more money so the child gets more money? Or can you retire at 62 and still get your child benefits even though you haven't reached full retirement age? 
Yes, you can retire early retirement and your child get the benefit. You need to speak to a financial planner. I cannot address the best time to do this. What you need to do is speak to a financial planner who's going to be able to look at your big picture of how much are you eligible for and taking into account your child would be eligible at retirement for 50% of that. Some families, instead of waiting to the amount getting higher, want it earlier because they know 50% is going to be available to their child. So that's something that you have to sit down and weigh out. There's no easy answer on that. You know, it really is individual on the best way to handle that. It really is about what's going on in the household. You know, um, uh, some families say they want to wait. Some families say, well, if my child's going to get half of what I'm eligible for or equal to it, then I want to do it now. Some families say that, you know, I want to do it past my normal retirement age because I want to continue working. And then, you know, when I get on the benefit, then my child will get a benefit based on my contribution. It's very individual. There is no broad stroke. This is the best time to do it. Right. You could do it early retirement. You could do a regular retirement. Now, if you do it late retirement, they'll never get more than 50% of your regular retirement. So at age 70 retirement, they, the child still gets 50% of the regular retirement amount. So that you mean the full retirement age? Correct. Okay. So there's no advantage to waiting to 70 financially for your child. Not for your child. Correct. Okay. Great. Um, what about children that qualified for SSDI due to a parent's death? How did they shift into adulthood services? And they would not have ever gotten Medi-Cal unless they had a waiver. Correct. Okay, so you just asked, okay, clarify the question if you would. I apologize. Okay, so when a parent passes away, right? Um, while a child is still a minor and they start receiving those benefits earlier in life than at 18 adulthood, um, how does that transition occur when the child becomes 18 and how and if they would they be able to get Medi-Cal to be able to maintain first, other services? Okay, first of all, there's two issues here you brought up, not one. Yep. The issue of transitioning from as a dependent surviving child to then a adult child with a disability getting benefits, continuing to get benefits based on the parents' contributions. Correct. It's a huge break. It's called age 18, adulthood. So prior to that, they're getting a benefit as a survivor. Once they hit 18, they need to have a medical record that supports that their disability is significant to be eligible for the program. Okay? So one, you're receiving it as a survivor. So dad may have passed away and there are three kids in the house. One child has a disability. All the children will receive a survivor benefit. And then when they hit 18, it stops, except for the disabled child, as long as that disabled child has applied and does have a disability that meets the criteria. Now, the SSI, or excuse me, the Medi-Cal, is different, okay? Every state, you have SSI and many states include Medi-Cal automatically. Some of them require that you do an application. If you're making the transition and you've not been on SSI, then you have to go for an eligibility category, which is what the term they use for the different types of programs uh, that the individual would qualify based on their, uh, how much, how high their benefits are. And I'll be going into examples of that in California. Thank you. I want to ask our participants who are listening in, if you would please use the Q&A for questions, otherwise your question may get lost in chat. Okay. Um, let's do one more question. There's just so many questions and we'll never get moving forward if- um, We're actually okay. Okay. 
So one of the questions is if the person who receives SSI as a disabled child, um, if their job goes away, can they then apply for eligibility for SSI? Okay, so here we go with that question is using the terminology incorrectly. Really important that the terms be used correctly. So is the individual is not receiving SSI as a child. The individual is receiving SSI as an adult. Okay. Now, if they're receiving SSDI based on a parent's contributions, that's when we use the term as a child. Two separate issues. Anybody over the age of 18 can apply for SSI. If they do work activity, the SSI benefit is reduced basically 50 cents on the dollar. If that, that individual is going to be determined at some future point is eligible for benefits based on the parent's record, if the wages they made were greater than SGA and you haven't done something like a work subsidy, they're gonna lose the ability to be able to get the benefit on the parent's record. And may actually, if their income's high enough, be able to get a benefit based on their record when their income drops. Okay. As Thank long you. as the medical record supports the disability. The medical record is the way the story of the individual with a disability is told. Many people say, well, my individual has this diagnosis or that diagnosis. My doctor said that my child is disabled. Well, that's great, but doesn't do anything with Social Security. Social Security does not look at a diagnosis alone. If they're ever looking at a diagnosis, they're looking at a diagnosis, and then how does that diagnosis manifest itself? They actually even have a book, which is called the Blue Book, when I do my training on how to uh, work with uh, Social Security to get somebody granted initially, that actually describes symptom or describes a, uh, a specific diagnosis and how it has to manifest itself to qualify as an automatic qualifier. I'll do one more question and we're moving on. Okay. There's a lot of confusion around the age for a disabled adult child between 18 and 22. People are asking, what if my child was born with a disability or acquired a disability at 16? Could you clarify that for them? Okay. Born with, remember I mentioned my child, the adult child who was age 13 and blind? Blindness doesn't go away. We still had to have records that supported when she turned 18 to get her on benefits. So it's really important that we, we separate ourselves from what was going on from birth and we focus on the records now that are telling Susie's true story. So if you have an individual that's been disabled since birth, when they're turning 18, right? We need to make sure that their medical record clearly shows that that disability that existed from birth based on records show that the disability is here and now. And I know that's illogical. It makes no common sense. And the records have to be within the last six months to a year to even be considered to be current. That's why I train my families that, you know, if we're going to start working on this particular case, I want you to go back to that evaluator as an example that may have done the neuropsych evaluation at age 13 and get an update. Or go see your pediatrician and talk to them about what is the level of details that you have about the symptomology of my child. Now, when we're talking what I call, I nickname it the sweet spot, 18 to 22, that focus right there is the window of time that we have to establish a disability for the specific event of accessing benefits based on a parent's record in the future. I am not now going over how somebody qualifies. That's a different training. Our focus is mom or dad retiring, and I'm telling you what needs to occur or what you need to have in place so that when you retire that your child can get a benefit based on your contribution. 
the issue of how people qualify, what are social security's rules to qualify, that would be a different training. Thank you. Completely and different can training. You, can you do Go one ahead. more clarification about benefit amounts based on two parents that have worked? How much, how do they determine the funds that the person will receive from the parent contribution? Mom and dad work. Mom is the higher wage earner, then the benefit is based on her. Dad's the higher wage earner, benefit is based on them. If you have a same sex couple, same issue. Whichever parent has the highest wage is what the child will get the benefit of. You could start the child on the benefit of the lower wage earner if they retire earlier. And then once the parent, uh, the other parent retires, then that parent uh, is, is the benefit that it's received on. It's either or whoever's the highest or when a second one retires, then it becomes that 50% or if somebody dies is 75%. Thank you. Now, what I'm talking about is a benefit based on a parent's contribution. I'm not talking about the regular SSI program. I'm not talking about the regular SSDI program. That's a different training. And yes, I am this dramatic all the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, um, after uh, an individual is granted wages, you need to realize that the child who's getting, if, if Social Security determines that the child's eligible to receive benefit based on the parent, they're basically covered now under the SSDI program and the record number holder is mom or dad. And that's the term that they use. When this adult child is receiving benefits based on a parent's record if they choose to do work activity. And this is going to be another training. The trial work months that are given, there are nine of them under the Social Security Disability Insurance are granted. They still have the 36 month extended period of eligibility. There are the three grace months, and there's five years expedited reinstatement. This particular slide is a training that I do in no less than an hour, okay? So if you have an individual who's receiving benefits based on mom or dad being disabled, retired or died, and they want to do work activity, they need to understand under Social Security's disability insurance work rules, because SSI has their own work rules, um, how those wages are gonna impact that benefit. And one thing I did forget to mention or put in a slide, if that child marries an individual that is not also an, as a, a disabled adult child or childhood disabled beneficiary, they lose the benefit based on the parent. So the only way a disabled adult child or childhood disabled beneficiary, if they choose to get married, can continue to be eligible they have to marry somebody who's also not just on SSI or SSDI, they have to be the same exact type. And then they both can still receive benefits based on their parent. I had a client whose child wanted to marry and they realized it and they were okay with the fact that that was lost. And then both of them went on to SSI um, as a couple. And fortunately there was enough resources to be able to take, to take care of them uh, in a special needs trust. Again, another topic that would be another training. So just be aware whenever you go into a benefits world, there, you know, somebody's going to talk about a subject matter and know that there are other subjects that surround that that may involve additional education. If you expect to learn this world and just get a few notes on this, and if I memorize this, there's a learning curve to this, and that's normal. When you go out skiing, you don't just jump off the boat and you're skiing. You have to actually work at it. You've got to develop muscles. This is the same kind of thing with this. If you have a child with a disability, it's hard enough dealing with their disability when it comes to the benefits. Again, it's going to be another learning curve. It's not that it's impossible. It just takes some work. Okay, let me go into any other questions before I go into health coverage. 
I'm going to do four questions. Thank you. All right. So there's a lot of questions about SGA. And the question is, is if their child makes so much money that they meet the SGA and they or they exceed it, can they maintain their Medi-Cal, maybe through working disabled Medi-Cal or Medicare if they had received that based on the parental contribution? Okay. Or does the SSDI, if the parents retired, continue even though they've exceeded SGA? Okay. So SGA is an issue that exists in multiple planes, okay? So it's not a standalone issue that only is connected to one. So you've brought up two areas that SGA, and there's probably about 12 areas that SGA comes into play when it comes to the world of benefits. I'm probably exaggerating, but you know I'm known to occasionally do that. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the issue of SGA, SGA doesn't automatically make the SSI uh, end what makes the SSI end is the work activity, okay? And when you have enough wages that wipe out after you do what's called the countable income calculation, then you lose the SSI because of the wages, but there's also a provision which is called, and I'm gonna be talking about that for California, 1619B, that'll allow an individual uh, to be able to keep their Medicaid, or we call it Medi-Cal in California, for as long as their income in California for the annual amount, and this is where, again, they're confusing. Sometimes they give you a monthly amount, sometimes they give you an annual amount, and they call this a threshold, a 1619B threshold. I'll be talking about that later, where their income is below $47,395 in the state of California. Uh, let's give you another state, Iowa, $43,741. Every state is different. Um, I just did training for the state of Louisiana. Louisiana's uh, 1619B is $32,162. So under 1619B, what that is, is a provision that they created. It's a special law they created to say, okay, we've got people on SSI, they're doing work activity, we don't want to discourage the disabled community from working because they're afraid they're going to lose their Medicaid. In California, we call it Medi-Cal. So we're going to allow their income to be higher. And we're not going to pay them SSI, but we'll keep the Medicaid in place at no cost based on the amount that's allowed for the calendar year in the state that you're in. When it comes to Medicare, whole different issue, okay? Medicare, you're going to get based on, and that takes me into my next slide so that I'm not doing this slide list. Medicare eligibility, you're 65 or older. You're diagnosed with permanent kidney failure, end stage renal disease. Uh, disabled from Lou Gehrig's disease, there's a three month waiting period. The first two, there is no waiting. And for people who are SSDI beneficiaries, that's either based on their contributions or the contributions of a parent, there is a 24 month waiting period for the individual, for the childhood disabled beneficiary and the disabled widower. Why am I going here now when the question was, if I'm working, how am I gonna lose my Medicaid? Well, when I, if you're an SSDI beneficiary receiving benefits based on a parent or your own record, there are work rules that I mentioned earlier that take about another hour to explain, where what they do is they transition you based on your wages off the program. And then they give you the Medicare for an additional eight and a half years. But eventually you could come off of Medicare and it's all based on the kind of income you're making. It's all based on the income. Uh, next question, since uh, that one took me into three slides. <laughs> Yay. All right. So there's... A Somebody had heard um, rumor that there are situations where people get kicked off of benefits, including SSDI benefits from a parent, when the second parent retires and their 
um, Social Security has been automatically reevaluated and evaluating the disabled person's status of disability. Have okay. you heard of that? I've not heard no, of that. Myself. You've got two points there. Okay. You're talking about, okay, first of all, be careful with rumors. Okay. Do you hear me? Be careful with rumors. The biggest rumor that I'm constantly fighting, the first time you apply for Social Security benefits, you're going to get denied. It's not true. In my private practice, 87% of my cases get through the first time. I'm not doing that as a commercial. I'm doing that if you have everything that you need in place, you'll get granted. You will. Okay, that's the biggest rumor that I deal with. Now, the rumor that, you know, they're going to try to kick your child off benefits by reevaluating them. Well, first of all, when a child is granted or an adult is granted, and, and please mind you, when I'm saying child, I'm referring to a disabled adult child. I'm not referring to somebody under the age of 18. But when that individual has been granted benefit, there is no such thing as permanent disability. That's a term that people like to use because it's used with the VA, it's used with workers' comp. It, Social Security has no such thing as a permanent disability, regardless of how severe it is. I have clients, I have a client that's a paraplegic. According to Social Security, they're still going to review his case every one to seven years. And if he doesn't have medical records where they need to be, he can be taken off the program. He's a paraplegic. He has two fingers that he works with. That's it. So it's really important that you realize when the person is on the disability, the, the medical records still need to be telling the story as you continue to go along. And the biggest challenge that we have often is that, you know, uh, Jane is on disability, things are going well, she's adjusted to her disability. And now when she sees the doctor, how are you doing? I'm great, I'm wonderful. It's because she's accommodated her disability and is not talking about her limitations, but the doctor is not putting down her limitations anymore. So her medical record shows marked improvement. Jane is doing really well. Jane's getting along with everybody really well. Jane doesn't seem to have any more problems. Well, the medical record is the truth of the individual. I always refer to it that way. It's telling the story of the individual, whether it's getting on benefits or continuing to be on benefits. So if somebody is getting a benefit on one parent, then the other parent retires. And even if the other parent goes back to work or whatever happens to the other parent, the child's not going to be reevaluated. They'll get switched back to the original parent. But the issue of there being reevaluation, that's a separate issue that occurs to everybody with a disability. One more question. Thank you. If somebody works and loses benefits because they exceeded the SGA, can they reapply for benefits, either SSI or SSDI, through the parental contributions without a reassessment? No. When, when you, it depends on how long you've been on benefits, okay? Oftentimes, if they work past a certain period of time, example, the SSI program does not look at SGA. The SSI does a 50 cents on the dollar reduction, and basically you can wipe your benefit out to zero. If you're at zero for greater than five years, you're off the program and have to do a brand new application. If you've been earning above SGA, okay, and then your parent, you want to get a benefit based on your parent, earning SGA has is now going to prevent you from getting a benefit based on the parent. It's it's the fact, it's not that you have to do, you know, the reevaluation that's the issue. You may have a genuine disability that's very easy to be able to support, but the fact that you've been earning SGA has now taken, separated you from the ability to be able to get a benefit based on your parent because you've had SGA consistently um, after you've turned 18. 
So that's where the problem is. You're, by earning SGA, you're separating yourself from the ability to get benefits based on the parent. Once you're on the benefit based on the parent and you earn SGA or whatever you earn, then there are work rules, which again is another hour presentation on how they view the income. I hope that answered the questions. Thank you. Can I slip one more in, Daniel? I think it's okay. Important. Thank you. Um, we have many families who have multiple children with disabilities, and I think the maximum family benefit should be mentioned. Okay. When you're getting, when you have multiple children that have disability, or even you could have a couple of children with disability and a, a spouse that's retired, all of those individuals then will fall under what's called your maximum family benefit amount. And that's not your benefit. So let's say you're eligible for $2,000. You're going to have a maximum family benefit that all of the individuals uh, in your household combined cannot exceed. And that's very, there is no number for everybody. It's all based on how much the person is eligible for. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm sorry, I keep on getting fuzzy and blurry. I'm used to being in a room full of people walking around being theatrical with an actual live audience. <laughs> so this is, this is, you know, I'm still learning how to do this Zoom thing. Okay, now in, I briefly touched on Medicare, talking about how you become eligible. Now I'm going to talk about Medi-Cal. There, and I'm going to focus on California. Know that whatever state you're in is, are going to have their own versions of these, which can be similar or completely different. But this is what we have in the state of California. There's SSI base. Now there are many states that do the SSI base, not all. There is age disabled federal poverty level share of cost Medi-Cal, and the California Working Disabled Program. The Working Disabled Program does exist by different names in many states. That's something that Social Security uh, went to Medicaid and said, each state, we want to encourage people with disability to work so they have a way for them to continue with Medicaid, even though they're doing work activity. So in California, and not all, but some states, a dollar of SSI means automatic eligibility for uh, Medi-Cal. Now, uh, SSI base, meaning I'm getting a dollar or more is gonna continue, uh, but what happens if I'm working and I've exceeded uh, enough benefits to where I'm down to a zero benefit and I, there is no dollar of benefits? There's a provision which we briefly mentioned previously, which is 1619B, which allows you, if you keep below your state threshold amount, to keep the Medi-Cal Medicaid in place at no cost. There's also under the Childhood Disabled Beneficiary, that's a program where we talked about getting a benefit based on a parent's record. Uh, there is a provision that allows the uh, Medi-Cal Medicaid to stay in place, which is called 1634C. So let's briefly go into these. 1619B, it requires that you've been eligible for SSI at least one month in the past year, and you continue to meet the disability requirements, meaning you still have your disability, but you're working. And you continue to meet the non-disability requirements. And that's uh, such as $2,000 in the bank, one house, one car. And mind you, that $2,000 in the bank, a lot of people say, where did that come from? Well, it came from about the 70s when it was enough to buy a Toyota Corolla cash and it was enough for a down payment on a house. Uh, but they haven't changed the law since then. You need Medi-Cal to continue health coverage to continue working uh, and you have income below your state threshold amount. So every state has a 1619B threshold amount. And in California, it's 47000 $395. Okay, 1634C. That's the provision that says you've got a, the, a child that is disabled and receiving benefits based on mom or dad's contributions. And that individual loses SSI 
because the income they're getting based on the parents is so high. Now, a lot of parents say, oh my God, they're losing SSI. Well, they're losing the benefit because they're getting so much from SSDI based on a parent's record, they're in a better position financially. SSI is only the payer of last resort to supplement based on need. People need to stop thinking, I've got to keep my kid both SSI, SSDI. You know, it's SSI is always a payer of last resort. And if you're SSDI eligible and you lose that SSI because you're a disabled adult child or childhood disabled beneficiary, you're at least age 18. And this is the tricky part. The computer record reflects that the SSDI continuing income is with a beneficiary identification code of C as in Charlie. You have no idea how often Social Security will process a case. They sit there and they process it. OK, and then they forget to hit that button. And then all of a sudden, that individual has lost the ability to access Medi-Cal, Medicaid, at no cost. And then they have to find a different way to qualify in the state they live in. And it may involve co-pays that are relatively high. So this is really important that people get this. So questions. If somebody's speaking, I don't hear them. Trudy? Thank you for that reminder to turn on my I'm getting comments too about how complicated this is for people. And I think that it's really important that people go to any session on these benefits as often as you can, um, because it begins to make sense after a while. There is yeah. a lot of question about form okay. 3033. Who can file it? You know, when do you file it? So lots of questions about so that. The, the 3033, that's an, a form that the employer completes. I have frozen. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, we can hear you. That's a form that the employer completes when you're wanting to get work subsidy to reduce the value of the wages so that you don't have an issue of SGA. And you get that social security form online and you only use it if you need to reduce the value now to get of the wages so that they're below sga now let me get to trudy's uh comment about oh my god this is like really confusing and some of you may feel like you're getting a tidal wave of information that's actually normal if this is the first time you've listened to this. And if your expectation is to attend this and be able to know exactly what to do, it's not gonna happen. It takes a while. It takes a while. Like I said, I use the analogy of the guy who is attempting to water ski. You don't just jump in the water and know how to water ski. You have to learn how it works and how to, and God knows I was terrible. I could never, I could never do it successfully. Um, <laughs> But it's really important that you realize that this process takes time to understand and you need to be willing to invest in that time to initially hear it the first time and be overwhelmed and then listen to it again and be aware that different presenters have different ways of talking about the same thing. You know, if we're standing in a sculpture garden and three people are looking at a sculpture, they're looking at the same sculpture, but they may describe it very differently. So just be aware that different people describe a lot of people with Social Security who does Social Security training, which I have nothing against it, but the style is to do what I call parallel training. They'll talk about SSI and SSDI. This is how this impacts this and this program. I like to separate them because there's enough confusion about the programs. So when I'm talking about one, I'm entirely covering that subject. And when I'm talking about the other, I'm entirely covering that subject. So it creates less confusion. That's just my style. Doesn't make me right or wrong. It's just the way I do things. So just be aware as you delve into this, you know, it's there's a learning curve, you know, and, and working, you know, with an expert that knows this 
and is able to communicate with you. And I'm not the only one in the country. There are nonprofits that understand this. You know, there are other people that work in this field, you know, as I do, who work with individuals with disabilities. Next question. Thank you. What about child support? How might that impact somebody's SSI or SSDI? Well, SSDI is based on contributions. Bill Gates can get retirement and his child could get if his child were disabled between the ages of 20, 18 and prior to 22, that child, as much money as he has or she has, could get a benefit based on the, on the parents. And it doesn't matter about any other money. They could be billionaires and they still get the benefit. So alimony, child support, nothing to do with SSDI. SSI, yes, it does impact it because SSI is based on need, supplemental security income, payer of last resort. If there's other money coming in, they reduce the supplement. Thank you. There's one person that mentioned their child is getting less than half of the amount of the social security for the parent. Any way to fix that? Something's wrong somewhere. I, you know, when I hear stuff like that, I wonder if the child is actually still on SSI and actually did not make the transition. I know of people that that uh, has happened to. Huh? I know people that that has happened to. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, the, if, if your child doesn't make the transition uh, for whatever reason, uh, the SSI is going to continue with the SSI amount. Now, one way to know when somebody's getting a benefit and what kind it is, the simplest way, SSI is always on the first. SSDI, being consistent as Social Security is, is sometime after. So if there's <laughs> no set date for SSDI, okay? And I'm not going to go into the spiel about how they decide it. But if it's on the first, the amount received on the first is SSI. And if it's on a weekend, it may be at the end of the prior month. Thank you. And that'll help you to see, oh, wait, I didn't get the benefit, you know, but my, my child's been disabled since birth. Well, did you have the records you needed between 18 and 22? And did they grant it? You know, a lot of times what will occur too is I had a case where somebody took somebody's social security application for regular retirement and said, oh, it's easy. We'll do this, that, and the other. And it's like, still took six months. It's not that easy. You know, you have to get all the pieces in part right. Just be aware right now, Social Security with COVID is operating unlike they ever have. So things are delayed because they typically, an office would have a couple of hundred people that physically come in and take the little tickets and sit there waiting for somebody to help them. Well, all those people are calling and Social Security wasn't designed as a major call center when you're dealing with the different local offices. They do have an 800 number, which I never use uh, because I don't get the level of consistency that I do when I actually work with the local office. Uh, and the local office, you can always find out on the Social Security website based on your zip code. There's a a place at the bottom where you can find the local office. Um, and they now give you the phone numbers, uh, you know, to the local offices and they even provide you the fax numbers because uh, they still operate very much on fax. Uh, they're not doing anything email. There's a few things that they do online, but I'm not going to get into all of that stuff. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to dealing with the local office, it's really important uh, you know, that you and the local office are aware of what's going on and the case is moving along. I find that cases will get stuck because they're so backed up. Um, and so just be aware as you're moving a case along, you know, make sure that they have what they need so they can take it to the next level. One more question. Thank you. Um, if somebody, if a parent did not file on behalf of their child prior to the age of 22, even though the person was uh, disabled and they did not receive any SSI for those years before the parent retires, um, 
are they not eligible for the parent benefit after a certain age? Okay, this is not uncommon. People come to me with this issue. I'll give you an extreme example. I had a parent come to me um, and their child was before the age of 22 was the 70s, okay? 1976 to be exact. You'd think, oh my God, and the parents retired and the individual's never been on benefits. Well, you know what the parents had done that I very rarely see? The parents actually had medical records from when that individual was 18 prior to 22. And with those medical records, we were able to establish that there was a disability prior to age 22 and after age 18, and they were granted benefits. Now, because we took so long to apply and he was already in his 40s, they're only going to give you a year retroactive. But that individual is now receiving a benefit that's equal to 50% of his father's income, but it's all evidence-based because they had the records in that window of time, okay? The easiest way to do it is get your child on SSI when they turn 18. And then keep, I always tell my parents, keep those records because just because somebody's been on SSI and now mom and dad retire, they are not allowed to, the term of art that they use is adopt a prior decision to make that connection. What needs to occur is they, they can pull the file and if they have the records, they can go ahead and do an evaluation and say, oh yeah, uh, Rita was actually, you know, we showed that she was disabled and we have the records. I tell the parents to keep the records, if at all possible, from that sweet spot is the most important part. So to answer the question, um, basically, it's possible, but it's all based on records. And the biggest challenge people have is that after seven years, most records are not kept. So it would be records that you would have to have from that period of time. Okay, I'm going to finish talking. I have one more question about this because it's related. If okay. a parent gets retirement benefits from Social Security and then the parent starts getting a PERS pension, so their SSA pension is or payment is reduced, does that affect the child's benefit? Yeah, because whatever mom and dad are eligible for, it's 50%. So if you have PERS, PERS is going to reduce how much you're eligible for. So it's 50% of what you're eligible for. Thank okay. You. We're going to talk about these are called eligibility categories another eligibility category uh, for california's medi-cal and know that other states have eligibility categories i'm specifically talking about california so that you have an example of the structure of how these work and in your state you can do the research and find out structurally what are the eligibility categories and what are the income qualifications so in the state of California, if we have an individual who is uh, not on SSI and not on 1634C because they were on SSI, then they became eligible for their parents' benefit, then this would be one of the ways or one of the programs we would see if they qualify for. So they have an income limit of, for an individual of $1,481 and for a couple of $2,004. If your income is 1482, you don't qualify for this program. It's got to be 1481 or less. It's all or nothing. So the way Medi-Cal or the different Medicaid programs work is they have different eligibility categories and it's not one size fits all. You either go this way or your circumstance changes and you go this way. So for this particular one, this is the cap. Now, let's say you have somebody who's got income that's a little bit higher than that cap. What they can do typically in California and in other states um, for whatever program they're trying to get on um, is have um, their Medi-Cal accountable income reduced by health coverage issues or expenses that they have. 
And let's say they, I have a, I have a client that literally picked up a dental plan, not for the purposes of the benefit of the dental, but to reduce the value of their wages to qualify for this program. Vision uh, insurance or other health coverage premiums that the individual is responsible for. The individual has to be responsible for it. So let me give you a quick example, okay? We have Helen's, she has monthly SSDI benefits of $1,500 a month. That is greater than California's 1481 that they allow. So what we do is we enroll her in a dental plan. We don't even care if it's a good plan because if she pays $60, then what occurs is her income drops below uh, 1420 and now she's eligible for the age blind and disabled federal poverty level, which in California, they nickname uh, non-sheriff cost Medi-Cal. Now, sheriff cost Medi-Cal basically is a very, very old program. The age blind and disabled program, um, I think it's like 20 years old. Before this was, this was it. You're either SSI eligible or you would have a share of costs many years ago in the state of California. So every state is different. So in California, we have what's called share of cost Medi-Cal. And basically it allows a maintenance need level of $600. When they wrote this law, that was, a month, that was enough money to pay a mortgage or a rental payment for a decent place. Whatever you have beyond that maintenance need level for this particular type of Medi-Cal, becomes your share of cost. And it's similar in principle to a monthly deductible. So let's give you an example. We have Mark who, whose SSDI income is 1520 per month. He's not a, uh, a previous SSI beneficiary that became eligible uh, based on his parents' record. This is based on his own contributions. So now he decided uh, that he's gonna drop COBRA which is how you continue the health coverage because it's too expensive. And so what happens is he tries, to, he enrolls in Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal says, okay, your income is too high to qualify for Medi-Cal at no cost because you're greater than 1481. So what they do is they allow him a maintenance need. And here is they allow a $20 any income deduction, subtotal of 50, a maintenance need of $600, which I mentioned earlier, now his share of costs, which is like a monthly copay, is $900 a month before Medi-Cal covers anything, okay? This is not true in all states, but this is the way it is structured in the state of California. If he would have been planning correctly, he could have either continued with his COBRA health coverage, Medi-Cal actually has a program that pays the premiums, um, or, he could have bought himself a health plan or some type of coverage to reduce his income. But let's say he doesn't do that. And let's talk about the last program I'm gonna cover before I open this up just for a slew of questions for probably about 45 minutes. Uh, so we have the California Working Disabled Program. Now there are versions of this in almost every state, okay? This is California's version. Okay, this particular program in our state says you still have to maintain assets worth uh, less than $2,000 in the bank, $3,000 for a couple. But in the state of California, our particular program, the resource limitation are exempt. They exempt retirement funds like IRAs, and they're not counted as an asset. So somebody could have an inherited IRA, they can have an IRA, whatever retirement product they have, is exempt from the $2,000 uh, resource limit for this particular type of Medi-Cal. Okay, they don't even look at the disability income the individual is eligible for. So what are they getting from California State Disability, Social Security Disability Insurance, if they're getting workers' comp, they're getting private disability, it's all exempt. The only thing they're gonna look at is they're gonna look at how much are they earning in wages, this particular type of Medi-Cal. And they require that you have a total countable income 
that's after they do the uh, the countable income calculation, but the simplified version is basically 50 cents on the dollar. You have to keep your income below $2,683 for an individual and $3,629 a month for a couple. This is an amazing program people don't take advantage of in a positive way. So I'll give you an example where an individual is earning $12,000 annually. That's $1,000 a month. Now we know for the California Working Disabled Program, they're not looking at whatever benefit they're getting from SSDI, uh, which is California State Disability or Social Security Disability Insurance or SDI from Social Security Disability. So we don't even talk about that here. Doesn't matter. They be, could be getting $3,000 a month and it's still exempt. Uh, we take $1,000 in earned income, we subtract, this is a standard countable income calculation. 65, a general $20 income exclusion. If there's any impairment related work expenses, that means uh, an expense that you have that's related to your job and the impairment in the calendar month, we're doing the calculation. Uh, we have 985 divided by two, and this individual has $492.50 countable income. And with that small of countable income, they're only gonna pay $20 a month for a premium. Let's see, $900 versus $20. It's a lot cheaper. So you remember Mark? who had a share of costs of $900? Let's give him a job. Mark's gonna take a part-time job that pays $300 gross wages per month. We do the countable income calculation and he has only a, countable, uh, only a total countable income of $107.50 and he pays a premium of $20 a month. So, the reason I went into all these different eligibility categories, even though I know that we have a, a, a national audience, is in your state, there may be ways that uh, Medicaid or Medi-Cal can be offered to you if you know about them. See, what makes a huge difference in the world of benefits is your knowledge is going to determine the benefits your child or the individual in your family or yourself, if you're an individual with a disability, are gonna be able to access. Everybody thinks, let me go to social security and they'll figure it out for me. Well, if you get a good person who really understands their program, they can make recommendations to help you to do things that are gonna work in your favor. Let me go to Medi-Cal. Well, it's not uncommon that I've seen Medi-Cal where they don't get the numbers right and they're really busy. The person doesn't know how to advocate on their own and they get put into a Medi-Cal program um, that is not the best one or the most appropriate one for them. So it's really about understanding how these things work. Now I've just covered a few subjects. There's the issue of how do you get somebody to qualify for disability? What is the medical record that is gonna make a difference? There's the issue of I've got an individual who's already on benefits and they're doing work activity, how does that impact their benefits? I talked a little bit on that. My main focus is mom or dad retiring, how do we get that connection so that the child could be eligible for a benefit based on the parent's contribution? That was the main focus up to that and for today. And I will now open it to general questions. Thank you, Daniel. All right, so. Could you define what a medical record is? A medical record is basically when it, there is a MD, PhD, and it could be a medical record or it could be a psychological record, okay? And it's held by a practitioner who is treating the individual. And that is the record that goes to social security or should, if it makes it, uh, to be able to determine if somebody is disabled or not. So if the records are being electronically requested by Social Security to the physician. How does the parent maintain a copy or get a copy of that for later determination if it's required? You, you have to request that. And you okay. request it from your doctors directly. Okay. And what I tell parents 
I'm all about binders. Um, I'm from the 70s, you know? I'm, I'm about, I like binders because in a binder, you can put information. I tell my clients all the time, if you're getting a lot of letters from social security, don't put them in a file folder. You're gonna drive yourself, you're gonna create stress for yourself. If you do a three hole punch binder, and then you put things category or you put them in order by date last forward or uh, oldest date forward back, whatever way you feel the most comfortable working, it's a good way to keep it. That's another way to keep medical records. But also I recommend because people have house fires. I had a family that had great medical records and the house burnt down. I recommend that people have electronic versions of them and find a secure way that's real important these days to be able to maintain them. So at some point they can access them if they need them. All right, thank you. There was a family who asked, do they have two children with autism on SSI now? How do they address when the child becomes an adult? And I know we already said this, this is a question from the Spanish speaker. So maybe a little bit more depth so that they would better understand. Okay, so if we have two children that are SSI eligible as under the age of 18, they have met the qualifications as a under 18 disabled individual. When they hit 18, they'll be reevaluated. When they turn 18, they're reevaluated. And they're reevaluated to meet the adult definition of disability. So today you're 17 and, uh, and, and 11 months. And in another month, you have to meet the adult definition of disability. So again, having good records that support disability at age 17 would make a big difference. Thank you. What's the accounting requirement for when a child begins receiving benefits based on the family contributions? The accounting requirements? Yeah, do you, like you have to do a report for SSI every year. Okay. So when you're talking about accounting, here's where I think a question is being asked, but there's another connector to it that's being missed. Whenever there's an accounting requirement, that typically lets me know that it's, there's a payee involved. A payee is when a parent is responsible for the child's benefit. That's the only time accounting is going on. If you have an SSI recipient that becomes eligible based on a parent's contribution, the payee issue is going to probably continue on and the reporting requirements of how the money is spent on their benefit is going to continue because if you're an ssi recipient there is no accounting required unless you're a payee what is you're responsible to do is to stay at or below two thousand dollars in the bank you can waste all your money and not have any liability because you didn't spend your money in an intelligent way. The only time there's a reporting requirement is when there is an individual who is the payee for that individual. And whether they're on SSI or SSDI, that being a payee continues. Go ahead, please. Thank you. How do you determine if your child has a C attached to their benefits? A what? The C, I, it came up from a couple of different people. How do we know if it has a C? And maybe it's related to 1619B. You said some other numbers about at that time. I'm not sure. I, so I whoever I, asked that, please be more specific. In yeah, your I don't know what a fee is because there is no such thing as a fee. When a it C, comes to, C now, is in cat, C is in cat. See, the oh, letter. oh, 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 I know what it is. Okay. So it's, it's a bit challenging. First of all, you have to call the social security office and find out if the, the BIC, B I C code is correct. And that's what the C stands for as in CAC. I thought you said fee, like in somebody's Sorry. charging a fee. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. 
<laughs> and your brain is spinning. <clears throat> All right. Excuse so, me. did you mention child and care benefits? No, I'm not going to go into it. Okay, it's a whole nother. Oh, that's, that's a right? whole different ball of wax, child and care. Okay, I'm not going to have so, time to go through that. If but you it, need information about child and care, Google child and care. Um, and SSA, and you will go, you'll be directed to the POMS, which is like their master plan for that benefit. rule book. Yes. So, yeah, child and care, it would be a whole different training. Too hard. It it's point. a huge one. So, All right. So, How do you let, delay me, the... let me finish. Let me oh. finish that question. Thank you. So, the person was asking, How do I verify if the, the C is in the system under the BIC code? Well, you first have to find somebody who understands what that is at Social Security. They often don't realize that. But if you say the BIC code, B-I-C, they may be able to check it. Also, too, uh, under Medi-Cal, if your child is starting to get Medi-Cal notices directly from Medi-Cal, that's when you know there's a problem. They may not have a share of costs now, but in the future they could because they're not connected correctly according to 1634C. And when I have cases like that, what I have to do is correct it with Social Security and then make the correction with Medi-Cal or Medicaid for that example. Okay, next question. It's another question about the higher wage earner not retiring until 78, lower earner, parent retires at 66, parents are the same age. What is the amount for the child? All right, we've got a retired parent who's age 66, it's 50% of that. Okay, and the 78 And then when old. the other wage earner retires, who's 78, it's whatever that wage earner, if it's greater, retirement would be at the normal retirement age, not at their late retirement age. So the, the full retirement age, on that report that you get every year from Social Security. Correct. And you can always find that out through the My Social Security website that works 87.3 point times. Uh, <laughs> you have no idea how many families that try to sign on to that and they get in this thing where they can't get in and then they finally get in. So the My Social Security website, if it's working, if you can log in, is a really good tool to understand where you're at or an individual is at. It is, I use it and it's very, very helpful. Um, what if you've got an absent parent and you don't know how to find them and your child, you wanna find out if your child will be eligible? I, you know, with an absent parent, it's tricky. You know, other than hiring an investigator to see if you can find them, social security, you, do you, if you have their social, you know, then you can try to file against their benefit that would be, you know, that could be done, but uh, the parent doesn't have to be present. Uh, you just need to have their social, their date of birth, um, and their current, uh, well, you don't necessarily have to have it. That would be a case where, you know, I would work with my local social security office and make friends. Friends <laughs> go a long way with social security. I have my friends in high places and it makes a difference. It does make a difference. All right. so. Um, the next question is, this woman's son was earning more on SSI, and I'm thinking receiving, not earning, than he's receiving now that I have become disabled and, and am receiving SSDI. His benefits dropped almost by half, and she does not understand why. Okay, so we have a son that was on SSI, and then mom went out on disability and the son is now getting a benefit based on mom's contribution. The son could still get SSI to supplement if it's below what they were entitled to before. Because that child, I have families where, you know, a, a mom, for example, may have been a stay at home parent or they may have been self employed and didn't really put all the wages into the system. Because all of this stuff we're talking about retirement and benefits based on the parent is all based on the contributions an individual has made based on their wages, either through an employer or as self-employed by how they file their taxes. So let's say 
Johnny was getting SSI of $900 a month. Mom's eligible for $700 because she didn't have a strong work history. She was self-employed um, and now she's not able to work. Uh, the son is eligible for 350, but he could still get the SSI to kick in. Thank you. So SSI may still be available. Okay, thank you. How soon, if you're going to retire and you want this to be a seamless transition for your child from SSI to SSDI, how can you make that less painful? Um, okay, so you can't file before an event. It's like having a car accident. You can't have a premonition that you're gonna hit the tree. You've <laughs> gotta wait till after you've hit the tree before you file. So I know that's a terrible analogy, but at 8.05, and I've been working since six, that's the best I'm gonna do. Okay. But, okay, so you have to have the event. What you can do is prepare, understand what your benefit amount's gonna be, have a sense of what your child's benefit's gonna be. Is your child already on disability? If not, when were they granted disability? Was it between 18 and 22? Do you have the records from that period of time? You don't need them as much if they were granted, but if they weren't granted, let's say your child's 26 now and you're thinking about retiring and your child's not been on any benefits. If you don't have records during the, what I call, nickname it the sweet spot, then you're gonna really have a hard time getting that child granted. So to prepare is to make sure that the child's already on SSI if possible, uh, make sure they're on SSI after age 18, uh, that you have good medical records between 18 and 22. That's how you prepare, because the medical part of this is the most complicated. Okay, so for those of us who are older and didn't know we should like save that stuff, my daughter's gonna be 37 in August. I don't have her medical records any longer from when she had determination done. How would I go about, you know, ensuring that there's no questions? And the, the follow-up question to that um, is, is there a reassessment? There's some questions about being reassessed when the child receives the parental contribution amount? Okay, two questions. Okay. Yes. So I'll do the second and go to the first. Thank you. So what happens when mom or dad retires is Social Security is responsible to verify disability during that 18 prior to 22. That's the assessment that's going on. That's what they're determining. And if the person was already on SSI, there's a strong likelihood that they may have maintained the records, Social Security, and then they would just need to review the records, verify the disability, and then go ahead and provide the benefit. Sometimes the records don't exist. Not very often, but I've had a couple of cases where that's occurred. And then there's no connection. You're not able to get the benefits granted. Can they do an assessment? I mean, you know, they want to- How are they able to do a recessment for a 30 year old based on where they were at at 18 to 22? All right, thank you. There's okay. no way that they can do, you, you can have an assessment and show the limitations of an individual, but the assessment is current assessment. It doesn't capture the past. Okay. The past is really important. So and if, between you don't that have age records, if you don't have the records, but the person was on SSI, there's probably a high likelihood that they'll call for those records and be able to support it. Okay. And regional center may also have records if they're regional center. If is, right? they have maintained them that far back. All right. Um, what about people who travel for significant amounts of time during the year? if somebody is getting the SSDI versus SSI? Okay, SSDI doesn't require that you be in any particular location. So that's based on contributions, whether it's you as an individual, 
you as a disabled child getting a benefit based on the parent uh, or even a survivor's benefit. So where you are, if you're traveling, is not relevant. SSI, on the other hand, is supplemental security income and whatever state you live in requires that you maintain the residence uh, for longer than 60 days to be eligible. So if you're out of the state that you normally live in for greater than 60 days, then whatever state you've moved to, then the SSI you would apply for there if you move out of the country for greater than um, 30 days, not 60, I said that incorrectly, sorry. Greater than, than 30 days, then under SSI, you lose SSI because SSI is connected to the state that you live in. You can visit somebody for 25 days and you're fine as long as you go back home. Okay, thank you. So if you're getting disabled adult child and Medicare benefits and you're eligible for Medi-Cal, working disabled Medi-Cal, um, how would, would Medi-Cal pay for whatever Medicare doesn't cover? And I think attached to that, and this is my attachment, is wouldn't Medi-Cal pay the Medicare premiums? Okay, you're giving me two questions again. I know. Okay. <laughs> You give it, it's like, let me tell you about this and let me add this onto it. Okay, so let me, I'm going to start backwards again. All right, so when it comes to Medi Cal, Medicaid, okay, they're going to pay as a last payer. Medicare is primary. And what they're going to do, like SSI, then they're going to come in and fill the gaps. So whether you're on working disabled program, whether you're on SSI, whether you're whatever type of Medicaid or Medi-Cal you're on, they typically will pay the premium for your Medicare. They'll cover the co-pays and deductibles. You still have to select the plan D, and that's another training, um, a plan D, which is a drug plan. Um, and, and then uh, they work with that to reimburse certain plan Ds, depending upon the plan D you pick. And then you have very little co-pays on your medications, relatively low, comparatively speaking. Um, you know, for somebody on on um, Social Security and they're not getting a, a you know greater than then a thousand dollars a month, you know, a ten or fifteen dollar copay can can be a hardship. But know that in the real world, uh, or not in the real world, that, that I have no idea where that came from. But know that in the world where an individual is Medicare eligible uh, and has selected a Part D and they're not on uh, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, co-pays can be as high as $100, $200 per month. So, you know, it, it's all relative to the individual. Did I get the question or did I go so far off on the first part? I'm not even sure what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going through all the questions, trying to make sure we can get as many as we can. Um, okay, so people want to know if they can get the copy of the presentation, so I'm going to answer that. There's no way for me to send it to you in chat, but if you really want this, there's 142 of you still online. Um, you can email PHP and we can send you the PDF version of these slides with that information. Um, can I add, uh, sorry, Trudy, can I add something? We will uh, send, we will send that if the parents ask to the parents answer the poll because their email is gonna get registered and they complete the poll. We will send that automatically next day. Ah, thank you. Did you hear yep. that? Stay for the poll, you'll get them automatically the next day. All right. There are so many questions. How do you know if, or can you put part of an SD, SSDI payment into a Cal ABLE account? And if you exceed the $2,000 limit for Medi Cal, I know this is a double question again. There you go again. I know I'm terrible because it's. it's but this time I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down this time. So first it's, question is Cal. I have not been drinking any wine. So just know it's just so how my brain works. What? <laughs> okay. 
So can you put the SSDI monies into an ABLE account? Yeah, that I got, and I'll be addressing that, but there was a second part okay. of the question. Um, and to do that, to preserve the Medicaid, I'm assuming because of the $2,000 limit. Okay. Cal Somebody Able thanked us for the comic relief, so. Okay, <laughs> Cal Able is a whole different subject matter, but I'm yeah. gonna cover it. Okay, Cal Able is California's version of A B L E, Able. Able is a national law that exists in all the states. Um, it allows in all the states, okay, for an individual because you see the SSI rules of $2,000 in the bank, one house, one car. Somebody decided they don't like that, so they changed the law by creating a whole new law. And they do that all the time. It's like a bad remodel. So they created a new law that if an individual has a disability that started before the age of 26, they can enroll in the Cal Able if there's one in their state, or they can select another state, or not Cal Able, but an Able account. California is called Cal Able. And it allows you to set aside up to $15,000 in a calendar year as, and you can go up to $100,000 uh, as total savings, okay? Um, at any point, you can be up to $100,000. Now, to get to the question, now that we've discussed what ABLE is, and the person is obviously from California because they're in Cal ABLE, unless they're in a state that they chose Cal ABLE, anything can go into a Cal ABLE. Grandma's $200 Christmas present can go into an ABLE account. Money from the individual's SSDI can go into the Cal ABLE account. Any, if the individual has wages, it can go into the Cal ABLE account and even increases the amount that you can contribute annually. So Cal ABLE is a wonderful vehicle that a lot of my clients, in addition, if they're high net worth, are dealing with issues around special needs trust, we'll have it be a part of it too. So CalAble is a way for an individual who has a disability after the age of 18, prior to 26, and their standard for showing that there is a disability can be either that you have been on benefits with social security, or you just have a physician statement that there is a disability. Um, or even the statement of a parent is allowed. Um, as long as the individual has a disability prior to age uh, 26, they're allowed to set aside in this special account up to 15,000 annually, and the account cannot exceed 100,000 at any point. You can put money from SSDI, you can put SSI, it can come from any source. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so another 1619B question. Um, to qualify for that, how if one month that year they're on SSI and the next year the person continues to make over SGA, will they still qualify for Medi-Cal? Okay, two different questions. The SGA issue is not an issue with Medi-Cal. The SGA is a social security issue, okay? Now, I realize that 1619B is an issue where your income is great enough to where you eliminate your SSI. And you can do that at being at SGA, or you can do that being, depending upon how much SSI you get, you could do that being at $1,000 a month, which is below SGA. So it's all about how much money are you making, what eliminates your SSI, and then you have to figure out what state you're in and what the 1619B amount is. And if you stay below that, you're fine. There now they realize that they've announced it to you as an annual number, and they do realize that even though it's an annual number, they're gonna do guesstimating or averaging for what it would be for, the, uh, for a month. Thank you. 
There's a lot of questions about 401ks and CalABLE. And what I wanna do is suggest that you talk to a financial planner. That's not really an area that Daniel can make recommendations. Um, he's really a benefits guy. So I wanna make sure that you get the proper referrals and you can always call PHP and ask for that or ask friends who's, who they have used. Right. Um, Somebody was told, and, and this was by PERS, that the PERS retirement does not affect Social Security. Do you know that, Daniel? Okay. PERS is a different program. Okay. So PERS does not affect Social Security because they're separate from each other. Now, if mom or dad Social Security gets reduced because of PERS, well, then, of course, what the child's going to be eligible based on the parent's Social Security is going to be less. So it's not that the PERS impacted the disabled child. It's that the PERS impacted the parent, which then the amount the child's eligible for is going to be 50% of what that amount is. Thank you. And, uh, and I'm not familiar with PERS, STRS, FERS, as far as they're having a program that is similar to this in the sense of providing a percentage of the parent's income could exist, but I don't know everything. Thank you. So if a child never had SSI or Medi-Cal because the parent died, because they got the other benefit through the parent death, um, so how could the child as an adult pay for the Medicare supplements if they don't have Medi-Cal? Medi Depends on how much they're eligible for. So, so, so if they're in California, you would look at the eligibility categories I talked about. If they're not in California, you would look at the eligibility categories for that state. Since there was no connection to the SSI program prior, then they're gonna just based on what they're eligible for, uh, as an adult will determine which Medicaid or Medi-Cal program they could qualify for. Thank you. Um, for the Medicaid waiver program, um, it said that people have to be on full scope Medi-Cal to maintain the waiver. This person wants to know what is full scope Medi-Cal and what isn't it. All of the Medi-Cal's that I've talked about are full scope Medi-Cal. Thank you. Uh, you Non-full scope Medi-Cal would be as an example, um, and we don't see this as much anymore because since the healthcare bill passed, uh, which they commonly refer to as Obamacare, there really is no reason for anybody, regardless of their income, to not have health coverage because uh, it's really become really easy for people to have health coverage. Um, when somebody's living with a disability, it's a little bit more complicated, but previously, before Obamacare, uh, people would be on what was called emergency Medi-Cal or emergency Medicaid, would be like for a hospitalization. That's a non-full scope. So they're using old terminology or uh, which I'm not aware of non-full scope Medi-Cal really being uh, offered anymore. Could okay. be wrong. What? Okay, so um, they've got to keep their resources below 2000 to keep the Medicaid or Medi-Cal. $2,000 in the bank, one house, one car. The exemption is the ABLE account. Okay. So that's where people have say, well, I need to save some money. Well, if you have a disability that started before 26 or somebody can state that, you open up a naval account and put it in there. If you have significant amount of money, let's say you come into an inheritance or you have a lawsuit, that's when you look at doing a special needs trust. Again, another program where you all should, you know, that you, you need to see a special needs trust attorney uh, to see if that's worthwhile. I tell my families, if it's greater than $50,000, you really need to look into a special needs trust. Thank you. 
And Cal Able is doing another session. They do them regularly. If you go to the Cal Able website, they will have a list of presentations about Cal Able accounts and be able to answer a lot of the questions about that. The other resource I want to mention is um, db101.org. And they have wonderful calculators that you can put in income and figure out how it's going to reduce SSI and lots of other things. So I, I encourage you to explore db101.org because Daniel is promised us an hour. He's given us almost two hours now. We yeah. aren't going to be able to get to every question um, because I promised him a dead stop at 90 minutes and it's been almost 120. So, so I want to When it thank comes to DB 101, please be aware that it exists in multiple states. Correct. So DB 101, if you're in another state, may or may not exist. Uh, I was part of the original team that created that website uh, and it's really well done. Uh, as far as explaining the different programs and how they work. Uh, be aware when you look up things online, unless you're dealing with the actual program, for the most part, be careful, because there's a lot of opinions that people have about how this all works, which may be accurate or inaccurate. DB 101 is a non-government uh, resource that I highly recommend that has good resources when it comes to issues. And even sometimes they you, you may not be a state that they're involved in, but they may be able to give you a national place where you can you know, find out what your question is. Thank you. I want to give Claudia an opportunity to launch a poll um, and filling that out will ensure that you get a direct email for the handouts. So it's in three languages. So pick the language that is yours. A lot of people learned a lot of stuff today. Good, I'm glad, awesome. what I love doing. Yes, and, and it shows because you really have the passion and the knowledge and you're so clear. Um, one of the questions that had come up is when you say you, people aren't always clear. And your example of Mark, was that the person, the ch disabled adult child or was that um, the parent, do you recall? No, that was just an individual with a disability. Okay, thank so you. So that could have been, that could have been somebody who was not SSI linked. Okay. On SSI prior to becoming a disabled adult child, that could that would be a, a uh, that could have been him or anybody eligible for that amount. Thank you. And I learned from Claudia when she put in the link to db101.org. So it is in chat. I also realized I could send messages to attendees. And while you were doing the poll, I uploaded the PDF. So it's in chat. So don't hang up. If you want it right now, go ahead and grab it. There's so many thanks and appreciations, Daniel. Um, I hope we can do this again. And I hope we can do it live again. And just if your question wasn't answered, you can always call PHP and they can give you some information and send you to someone. If you want to engage Daniel's services, Daniel, are you a flat fee? Are you an hourly fee? I, People are asking. Just so that everybody's aware, I am uh, not a nonprofit. I don't have the staff to uh, work with people that aren't part of my, uh, my who aren't clients of mine. Um, I do charge a uh, hourly rate to do the work that I do. Um, I'm a non-attorney and I've been doing this for 30 some years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do love what I'm doing. Uh, and 
you know, this is it just give yourself some time to process this. You know, it's not uncommon that families can deal with this stuff alone. Most of the families I work with are families that have the ability to be able to private pay uh, and um, they don't want to deal with it personally. They'd rather have somebody else uh, either guide them through the process or actually take on the heavy lifting. So that's, you know, it's up to you. Thank you. It is now 8.30 almost. So we have a couple of seconds and thank you. I, I'm always learning something. It was a little harder this time because I was <laughs> screening questions at the time. Um, but if you really valued what you learned today, please take the poll. It's very important that we're able to kind of evaluate how we're doing in bringing you information. And if you're not a supporter of PHP, you know, we're just like PBS. We need your support at PHP so that we can continue to bring you programs like this. And our website is www.php.com. This recording will be on that site in the near future once it's edited and it will be there for your ongoing learning. So know that our goal is to support you all along your child's life. And we want to make that as easy as possible for you. And we hope that you'll also support the agency if you're able. We know these are high, hard times for a lot of people who have been out of work due to COVID. And, um, but we appreciate any support that you can give PHP, either volunteering, but we always accept money, <laughs> like every other nonprofit, so that we can pay for our building, our staff, and um, continue to expand our programs. Thank you all very, very much for being here. We had about 170 people um, that learned today, and it's been a wonderful experience, as it always is with you, Daniel. And 57% of the people, even though they were probably quite confused, felt like they learned a lot. Good. And only 5% was, oh, poquito, and zero at nothing. So everybody learned tonight, and that's our hope and our goal. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, and hopefully we'll see you in the future.